This is chapter 12. It deals with the characterization and classification of eukaryotes. Now those eukaryotic organisms that are microorganisms that we will be looking at, and they're always included in the general field of microbiology, are protozoans, fungi, algae, the slime molds, as well as the water molds. There are both human pathogens in here, as well as some microorganisms that are necessary for human survival, for human life to occur. Reproduction of eukaryotes is a little bit more complicated than in prokaryotes. Remember, prokaryotes like to keep it short, sweet, and simple. And it's a little bit more complicated with eukaryotes. Number one, their DNA is packaged in the nucleus. And so it's in a, a separate uh, part of the cell. There are a variety of asexual reproductive uh, methods that can occur depending on what species you're looking at. Many will reproduce sexually by forming gametes, which are the sex cells, and then zygotes. And then you've got some of your eukaryotic organisms, like some of the algae, some fungi, and a few of the protozoans. They can reproduce both sexually or asexually. The nuclear division. This, your nucleus is going to contain copies of the DNA. The DNA has to replicate prior to cell division occurring. So because there's a nucleus, normally you're going to have DNA replication occur, and then you're going to have nuclear division. Now it's normally timed for the nuclear division to end about the same time as the cytoplasmic division. So you have multiple things to divide here. The nucleus may contain what, just one single copy of the genome, of the DNA. In that case, it would be called haploid. Most fungi are haploid. Many of your algae are, are haploid, and some protozoans as well. If it contains two copies, now in humans, we're used to most of our cells, other than the sex cells, are diploid. They have two copies. you got one copy from mom, one copy from dad, and that kind of helps you to to visualize this. Those that are diploid, this would include your plants, your animals, and then once again, some fungi, some algae, and protozoans. There's two types of nuclear divisions that can occur, mitosis and meiosis. In mitosis, you are going to um, divide the nucleus. You will uh, end up with two daughter cells that will be genetically identical to each other. They will be genetically identical to that original parent cell. There are four phases of mitosis, it's prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. You do need to be familiar with what occurs in each stage and the names of them in order. There's different ways of trying to remember the different um, stages. Lots of people come up with different ways. One that I usually teach, obviously, to college students for helping you keep it in track of which order is uh, for the PMAT. Some people just learn it as PMAT, but one way that I teach it is pass me another tequila. And if nothing else, it should give you a chuckle. So when you look at mitosis, this is showing up in the upper um, portion of the cell that um, you have different colors of the DNA. That's representing, you know, one from mom, one from dad, essentially. In other words, you've got the purple and the green that are the same size. They're identical. In prophase, what's going to happen is the nuclear membrane will start to disintegrate. Your nucleolus that's in the, the nucleus, that also disintegrates. You do see the appearance of spindle fibers. Um, they are attached to centrioles, which are going to start to move to opposite ends of the poles. In metaphase, the centrioles now have moved to the opposite ends. You can see those strands, those spindle fibers that are extending from them. They also then attach to the chromosome. So one is, end is attached to the end of the centriole. The other end is attached to the uh, chromosome. And in metaphase, think middle, because the chromosomes are going to be lined up in the middle. 
Anaphase, think apart. Now the spindle fibers start to contract, and so the chromosomes will separate. They've already replicated uh, before you started any of this process. And so now they're, the two strands are being separated. They're being pulled apart in anaphase. They get pulled towards the centriole, so they're being pulled towards opposite ends of the cell. Telophase is the reverse of prophase. You start to see the formation of the nuclear membrane around those new chromosomes that have been separated. The spindle fibers are going to disappear. And what's going to happen, as you can see, you've got at the end of telophase two new nuclei. They are identical to each other, as I said before. They are identical to the original parent cell. Now, cytokinesis, which technically is just the division of the cytoplasm, that is time to end at the same time as telophase. So what you see at the bottom there, you've got two nuclei within the cell, but in the middle, it's going to have cytokinesis occur and pinch it into two separate cells. Meiosis, this is very similar, but there, there are some distinct differences. There's two stages to it, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. The only cells typically, so like an animal cells that go through meiosis would be the gametes or the sex cells. The purpose of meiosis is to decrease the number of chromosomes by half. So you're going from a diploid cell to haploid cells. You'll notice, as I said, similarities to mitosis, but some of the major differences are, number one, you will end up with four daughter cells. They are not genetically identical to each other. They are not genetically identical to the original parent cell. As I said, there's going to be two separate stages of this, and the daughter cells will be haploid. They only have one copy of, of every chromosome. Now, if you're wondering, well, why would it go through this? The reason is to maintain the integrity of the number of chromosomes. Most organisms can detect if they're missing some chromosomes or if there's an extra one. And in most cases, what's going to happen, it's going to trigger a process eventually basically killing the cell, not allowing it to continue on. Because it's like it's been flagged. Ooh, there's a problem here. We don't have the right number. So what happens with meiosis, the sex cells, which would be involved with sex, sexual reproduction, when the sperm and the egg, say in humans, when fertilization comes together, humans have 46 chromosomes in the diploid state, so they have 23 pairs. In meiosis, what will happen is if that's the process of producing the sperm in males and the eggs in females. And I'm using humans as an example for this because I think that obviously you can relate, I think, a little bit better to that than, say, a fungus. So meiosis is production of the sperm in males, the eggs in females. It's reducing the number of chromosomes from 46 down to 23 so that when fertilization occurs and you have that union of the egg and the sperm, you have 23 from the sperm, 23 from the egg, they fuse together, now you're back up to 46. So like I said, it's maintaining the integrity of the number of chromosomes for that particular species. Now with meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, those two stages, each stage has four phases, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. I will tell you that a lot of books, and myself included, will be a little bit picky in that normally in meiosis 1, we label it as prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, telophase 1. And in meiosis 2, we label it as prophase 2, metaphase 2, anaphase 2, and telophase 2. And why am I picky about this? It's so that you can distinguish that, say, metaphase 2 is different from metaphase 1, and it's different from metaphase. So I'm trying to make those distinctions. This is just a summary of showing for meiosis. You start out once again with a diploid cell, so it's very similar to when you first start with mitosis. In, my, in prophase 1, you do have the chromosomes congregate 
the what we call homologous pairs match up, the similar pairs. The, the purple that's identical to the green one is going to pair up and form a tetrad. The nuclear membrane starts to disappear. You do see the centrioles appearing and the spindle fibers appearing and the centrioles starting to move to opposite ends of the pole of the cell. They'll sometimes distinguish early versus late prophase one. And late prophase one, as you can see, the centrioles are still moving to opposite ends of the cells. One thing you may notice, look at the larger chromosomes. There is something that can happen here that is known as crossing over. Crossing over is when you can have an exchange occur between identical chromosomes. And it's occurring right here. The purple is going to exchange with the green in this segment right here. And so when you look at metaphase one, guess what? You've had an exchange of some genetic material here, and you also had exchange of the genetic material here from the crossing over right there. Does this always happen? No, it does not. If it does happen, it will happen in prophase one. It is something unique to meiosis that can occur. In metaphase one, the chromosome, these pairs, because remember, these, this is what we call the tetrad. These pairs will line up along, right along the middle of the cell. And then in anaphase one, they are going to be pulled apart. In telophase one, now you have the formation of the nuclear membrane again around uh, these chromosomes. You have cytokinesis occurring where you can see that pinching in as you are forming two new daughter cells. You're only halfway through, though. What happens to each of those daughter cells? They will, each one, and that's why we've got the two lines now at the top, will then move into prophase two. Once again, if the nucleus had formed, then the nuclear membrane disappears. You have your reappearance of your spindle fibers. They moved opposite ends of the pole. Metaphase two, the spindle fibers are now at opposite ends of the cell, and the chromosomes are lined up right down the middle. Anaphase two, the chromosomes are pulled apart. Telophase two, you have the disappearance of the spindle fibers, the reappearance of the nuclear membrane, and cytokinesis is occurring. And down at the bottom now, you have four haploid daughter cells. They're not genetically identical because, like right here, this one has one solid long purple strand and a short green one. But over here, this is a long green and a short purple, so they're not identical. This table shows uh, comparisons of the mitosis and meiosis uh, processes. Remember, both of these are types of nuclear division. They are only seen in the eukaryotic cells. And then, like I said, that cytokinesis, technically that refers to just the division of the cytoplasm, but it's always included with mitosis and meiosis because they're timed in at the, the same time. There are some cells, some organisms, some algae and fungi, where cytokinesis may not occur every single time. It might be delayed. And what happens then is you end up with cells that have more than one nucleus in them. And we refer to those as the xenocytic cells or xenocytes. This is just showing different types of cytoplasmic division that may occur. And sometimes what happens is you can have, like I said, multiple mitosis without the cytokinesis. So you do end up with multiple nuclei, and then all at once cytokinesis will occur, releasing all of these daughter cells at once. It just depends on which organism you're talking about. In terms of classification of eukaryotic organisms, Initially, they were based on structural similarities, and then modern classification, we've had to go back because of our increased knowledge with DNA. And we now base the classification schemes more on the DNA sequence. The idea is that the more similar you are, the more similar your DNA should be.
So this is just kind of showing you that, yes, the field of taxonomy, which is the field of classification, has gone through a lot of different changes um, as to basically where do we put different organisms. For years, they used to group fungi in with plants, and I used to kind of always laugh about that with some people I knew, and it's like, Fungi don't carry out photosynthesis. Why would you group them with plants? They get their own group, their own kingdom. So just be aware that, the, well, science in general is constantly changing. Well, so is the taxonomy. We're going to start with protozoans. They're a very diverse group. Obviously, they're eukaryotes because we're studying them in this chapter. They are unicellular, I mean, they just have one cell. They lack a cell wall. They can be modal by several different means, either by um, cilia or flagella. They may have pseudopods. Protozoans are kind of a an interesting group. It's sort of where the catch-all group. It's where we put the organisms. We don't know where else to put them. They require a very moist environment to live in, so a lot of times they're in ponds, streams, lakes, or right near them. Um, very few of them are actually pathogens. Some of them will have more than one nucleus. Um, let's say there's a wide diverse group here. Some will have contractile vacuoles that help to pump water out so they can move. Some of them may have different stages in their life cycle. Some of them may have a very modal feeding stage and then go into a resting stage, which would be basically a cyst. So this is showing a vacuole um, that can contain water. When it contracts, it squirts the water out and it propels the organism. Kind of think of a balloon. If you blow up a balloon and you release some of the air, it's going to go flying in the opposite direction. The air goes one way at the end and then the, the balloon's going to go flying the other direction. It's kind of that. Squirt water out, move the opposite way. In terms of nutrition, most protozoans are chemoheterotrophs, so they have to get their nutrients from some other organism. Um, there's a few of them that are photoautotrophs. Most will only reproduce asexually, oftentimes by binary fission or the schizony, which is the process where you produce a lot of the nuclei and then release all the daughter cells at once. In terms of classification, once again, that has changed over the years because of DNA technology. Uh, currently, they're organized into one of six different groups, as you can see listed here. Within these groups, Parabasala, they lack mitochondria. They have just a very uh, one single nucleus. Um, there are a few of these that are important in terms of medical, like the trichinolins. Some of them have rather unique um, structures to them. Diplomonadia also lack mitochondria. Um, they're also going to lack Golgi bodies and proxosomes. So you can see they're very um, simple in their structure. One of the most prominent one of these that, from a health standpoint that's pathogenic is Giardia. Giardia is the protozoan that's often associated with contaminated water, especially if people are out camping, out hiking, etc. It tends to often be in the water. It's passed through the intestines of other organisms. And you can't see it, obviously, because it's microscopic. So it's, it's often the one that will cause what we will refer to as intestinal distress. Another one of the groups of protozoans are the euglenosa. This contains the uh, euglenids. They're kind of interesting because they will have characteristics of both plants and animals. So, I mean, initially when those identified, it was kind of like, oh, where do you put this one? Well, it has characteristics of both, but it's not really either one. So you put it into the protozoans. This does have uh, mitochondria. Glenosis, um, I say there's different ways of originally is classifying them. And now that 
with the change in the classification schemes they are put in, obviously, into the protozoans. As you can see in this picture, they do have the chloroplasts, so that is why they initially were thinking, oh, this, is this a, a plant? But they also have a flagella, which is what you would typically see more with um, uh, animal cells. And here you can see they can be very distinctive. This is a blood smear. And so these are your red blood cells, but you can definitely see these are not supposed to be there. So that obviously is a sign someone has a protozoan infection. The alveolates, um, they have these membrane-bound cavities within them. Don't really know what the purpose is, so there's a lot of things we still don't know. These are divided into three subgroups. So here you can see uh, the flagella, the cytoplasm in there, and those little uh, alveoli or those little um, cavities, if you will. Ciliates, they have cilia on them. That's how they get their name. In order to allow them to move uh, through water, they are chemoheterotrophs. There's only one here that is pathogenic to humans. And then um, the AB complex and cis disc uh, contain the protozoans such as Plasmodium, Cryptosporidium, and Toxoplasma. And once again, just like when we discussed the protozoans, um, or excuse me, the prokaryotes last time, for all these eukaryotes, in terms of the diseases caused by them, where I may mention here like this, you know, that where you do have pathogens associate with a particular group, but in terms of the specific diseases, that will be discussed at a later time. This is, okay, I'm a science nerd. To me, this is a really cool picture because the this structure right here, this bluish one, is a paramecium, and this other um, cilia, this is another protozoan, didinium, is engulfing him. So it's kind of a cool picture, but they caught it right at that moment. Dinoflagellates, um, these do contain uh, pigments for, that carry out photosynthesis. They used to be classified as algae. Uh, some of them are modal and will have flagella on them. A lot of the dinoflagellates are bioluminescence, which can be really cool if you've ever been um, Sometimes at a beach, if they're there at night, as the waves splash, it you, you see that bioluminescence, which is that glowing. It's really, really pretty. Or sometimes you just put your hands in the water and move your hands, and it fluoresces. It's, it's really, really pretty. I've also seen pictures of um, when people have been on cruises sometimes, and they go through an area where there's a lot of these dinoflagellates that the weight behind the ship glows at night. Obviously, it's not going to happen all the time, but when it does happen, it's really kind of pretty and cool to see. Now, some of them can be the cause of red ties, which is not going to be a good thing because that's going to deplete oxygen levels in the water. And also, some of them do produce neurotoxins, which that opens up another whole uh, issue of things to have to deal with. So this is showing um, an example of one type of dinoflagellate, complex structure on it, and you can see it does have flagella on it. <coughs> Rosaria is another group. Um, they tend to move and feed using pseudopods. Amoebas are within this group. Um, so as you see, there's different types of them. And some of them um, can form almost like a hard shell on the surface that's made out of calcium carbonate. And then this is another time. So oftentimes the protozoans, we don't spend a whole lot of time studying because there's not um, a whole lot that are pathogens. But in terms of, say, like environmental microbiology, if for nothing else, they have a lot of really cool shapes to them. Within this group, Nagleria, this is uh, certainly one that we're seeing more cases of. Infecting humans, it's often associated with freshwater, um, 
sometimes it's been referred to as the brain eating protozoan, where somebody is in water that is contaminated, typically fresh water. You, and obviously, once again, you don't see them, so you don't know it's it's there. And if you ingest the water, it can very quickly cause very severe problems and can lead to death. Um, so when we talk about the diseases and the way it works, one of the big things is if you're out swimming in ponds, just close your mouth, don't drink the water. And then you also have some slime molds that are now classified within this group as well. So this is a table that shows the various characteristics of the protozoans and different special features about them. Fungi. Fungi are heterotrophic, excuse me, chemoheterotrophic. Um, so they have to get their source of carbon and energy from organic compounds. They do have a cell wall. So the cell wall, though, is composed mostly of chitin. Uh, this is the same uh, hard material that forms the exoskeleton of insects. They do not carry out photosynthesis. In terms of physiology, they're often more closely related to animals. What is the significance of the fungi? They are decomposers and they're recyclers. So they help to decompose dead organisms and they help to recycle nutrients such as the nitrogen, the carbon, the sulfur, the phosphorus, etc. Fungi are very important in helping plants to absorb water and nutrients. They can be used for food. They can be used to manufacture foods and beverages. They help produce antibiotics and other drugs that we use. Um, they are the major plant pathogen. They are the major cause of diseases in plants. Um, and so from an agricultural standpoint, they can be really good, but they can also be really bad. They are a problem with a lot of what we call post-harvest uh, issues, meaning after the farmer has harvested his crop of, say, strawberries or whatever, is that fungi, you know, they like them just as much as we do, and they can cause spoilage and rotting of various food items. With the morphology of fungi, there's two basic body shapes. There's mold and there's yeast. Now, mold tends to be multicellular. It's composed of long filaments. We call those filaments hyphae. Yeast, the difference is it's single cell. They tend to be small, globular. Uh, some fungi are dimorphic, meaning they can, depending on where they are in their life cycle, look more like yeast or switch and look more like mold and be the multicellular. How does it determine which shape, what form it's going to be in? It's usually in a response to a change in the environmental conditions. So in this picture, it is showing these strands, those filaments, which we call hyphae. Now you'll notice it's called septate. What that means is you have these cell walls, these divisions in here. Some hyphae are aseptate and you don't see those divisions. It's almost like one long humongous cell. And then over here you have the yeast. Notice that they're globular instead of strand-like. And then over here, this is dimorphic. So you've got the filamentous form here, and then you've got the yeast form over here. When you have a mass of the hyphae, that is called mycelium. So each one of these individual strands would be a hyphae, but the entire thing, you, this whole entire mass, you refer to as mycelium. So how do fungi get nutrients? Well, most of them will acquire it by absorption. Saprose means that it's feeding off of dead and decaying material. So they're really good at recycling anything that dies. If we did not have fungi on this earth, we would be amassed in huge amounts of dead material, basically, because the fungi are recyclers. They're, they're decomposers. They're going to help break that all down. Now, oftentimes, organisms, when they are 
getting their nutrients, they bring the entire nutrient substance into the cell and then break it down inside the cell. Fungi are a little bit different. It's kind of like, let me break down this big substance outside the cell, and then I'm going to bring the smaller components, absorb those smaller components in. So it's almost like it's digesting it outside the cell, and then it absorbs in what it needs. Now, some fungi will feed on bacteria, some feed on animal cells, some feed on plant cells. It just depends on the species. Uh, some are able to trap and kill nematodes, which are small worms, typically in the soil. Um, most fungi are aerobic, meaning they do need oxygen. Some yeast are facultative anaerobes, which means they would prefer the oxygen, but they can live without the oxygen. This is kind of, once again, kind of a cool picture. As you can see, there is the nematode here. As I said, that's a small worm commonly found in soil. And this strand is from a fungus. So you have this fungus here that is wrapping around. It's going to basically end up squeezing and killing this uh, nematode and then eating it, basically. Reproduction of fungi, um, most can reprodu reproduce sexually, some also reproduce asexually. Some will reproduce by what we call uh, budding. It's very similar to the budding that you saw in the prokaryotes. So yeast will typically do that. Um, they can also carry out what we call asexual spore formation. Oftentimes what they will do is they form a very long filament called a pseudohyphae, and then they um, produce spores on the end of that. The way the spores look, and here's the pseudohyphae with the spores on the end, the way these spores look, whether they are just kind of free or whether they're encapsulated in a structure, what does that structure look like? Is it round? Is it open on the top, open on the bottom? Are the spores just formed on the end of strands like this? We use that to help classify the organisms. So once again, it's going to be very specific to the species as to if it forms a spore, what that looks like. Is it free is an encased in a, a capsule type thing. Um, exactly how does that look? Sexual spore formation in fungi can get a little bit complicated. We do designate species as either being positive or negative, and there's four basic steps. So as you can see here, you have your fungus. In the hyphae, it's what we call dicarion because you've got two nuclei there. It's reproducing. You get this budding out, so it's, it's reproducing. Now, sometimes what can happen as it goes into the diploid stage, the two nuclei will fuse together. So these are all going to be diploid cells now at this point. So they have two copies of every chromosome. Over here it goes... The, uh, the process of meiosis will occur. So each of the resulting cells now will be haploid. And we refer to some of these are what we call plus and some are minus. Mitosis is going to occur. So these still just have one copy, but you've now made multiple copies of them. When the tips fuse together, now you have formed this dicarion, this cell that has two nuclei. The nuclei hasn't fused yet. It's not going to fuse until over here. So this is a quick summary of how the sexual reproduction of spores occurs in fungi. Classification of fungi, once again, with the DNA technology that has changed where some fungi are placed. And then there's um, another thing I'll talk about in a moment. That is also something to keep in mind when looking at classification of fungi. There are four divisions now, divisions with fungi. I don't know why. Mycology is the study of fungi. For some reason, way back, mycologists divided fungi into divisions instead of phylums. 
but they are essentially a phylum, like what you would see with the animal kingdom. It's in the same level of classification as a division. So there's four divisions, the zygomycota, ascomycota, basidiomycota, and then the deuteromyces. Zygomycota, as you can see, has over 1,100 known species. Most of these are saccharides. Um, some will be obligate parasites of fungi and other insects. Uh, some of these used to be classified as protozoans. They've had to kind of move them around a bit. This is a, just showing a picture of some. The Ascomycota has over 32,000 known species, so obviously a much larger division. Typically, their spores we call ascospores, and they're going to be in sacs. They're going to be contained within sacs. They can also make conidiospores, which tend to be on the end of hyphae. A lot of these are the ones responsible for causing spoilage of food items. So they're concerned for food microbiology, concerned for agriculture. Uh, some of them can be uh, plant pathogens. Some of them are also human pathogens. But on the flip side, some of them are also very beneficial. This includes penicillium, the fungus that produces the antibiotic penicillin. So they're not all bad. Saccharomyces. Many of you, if you do a lot of baking, may be very familiar with saccharomyces. This is used for making bread. It's used for making a lot of food items um, and also beverages. So a lot of them are beneficial. They're not all bad. This is showing uh, the fruiting body, a mushroom. This is a morel specifically, but this is a mushroom. This is the fruiting body, the sexual uh, fruiting body of uh, the fungus. I will just say if you like mushrooms, uh, please be very, very careful if you decide to go out and harvest your own mushrooms in the wild. You must know what you are doing because there are some that are quite edible, such as morels. But if you don't know what you're doing, there are some that look very similar to each other. One may be edible, the other one would be fatal if you eat it. So please, please be careful. I have known cases of where people have gone out, harvested their own mushrooms, and within hours they are fighting for their life and are needing a liver transplant. So please be careful. The division of Basidio mycota, this 22,000 known species here, this does include a lot of the mushrooms, as said, the fruiting bodies. Um, a lot of these are decomposers, so they're very beneficial in terms of nutrient recycling. But the mushrooms, like I say, uh, if you don't know what you're doing and you pick the wrong one, a lot of them do produce toxins. Um, a lot of the basidio mice can also cause problems in agriculture in terms of being plant pathogens and ruining crops. So this is some examples of the basidio carps. The, fruiting body or the mushrooms. Deuteromycetes, some books will refer to this as fungi and perfecti group. To identify fungi, you're going to obviously look at them. Well, one of the things to help classify them is to look at the sexual reproductive stage and what does that look like? What do those spores look like? What does that fruiting body look like? If you don't see that stage and like I say whether it goes through it or whether it goes through asexual reproduction is often determined by environmental conditions. So if you don't see it you don't really know where to classify the fungus. You know it's a fungus. It, does it go in ascomycota? Does it go in basidiomycota? That's usually the two that you're trying to decide between. And so what has happened is until they see that sexual stage, that fruiting body, 
they stick it into this category. It's kind of, okay, until we know what you are, we're going to put you here. I have known people who specialize in mycology, and they've been working with some fungi that were discovered, and it was five years before they saw the sexual stage form to know exactly where to classify it. And so, just so you're aware, mycology can kind of be a little confusing at times because initially if it goes on deuteromyces, it might be given one name. Say after five years, oh, you finally are showing us the fruiting body. So now I know you really should be in the Ascomycota division. So you put in an Ascomycota, and for whatever reason, oftentimes they will change the name. So when you go to write a paper, years ago when I was doing research and had published papers, sometimes it would be really frustrating because I did work with fungi for a while and you would have to list, you know, I worked with um, fungi A and give the, the name of it. You know also known as BB, also known as CC, previously known as DD. And so you had to list all the various names that had ever been called so anyone reading the paper would know exactly what you were talking about. Lichens, this is a symbiotic relationship between fungi and algae. Uh, symbiotic meaning you've got two organisms that's of a benefit to both of them. The fungus is going to provide nutrients, it's going to provide water and protection for the algae. The algae is going to provide, because it's able to carry out photosynthesis, it provides the carbohydrates and the oxygen. They are in almost every habitat. We tend to classify them by the shape. There's three basic shapes of them. They um, from can actually create soil from weathered rocks. A lot of animals will eat them. They'll be a food source for them. Um, one thing with lichens is they are very susceptible to air pollution. And so there has been some concern in some areas. They're actually kind of used as a marker that if you see a decline in the number of the lichens, um, start looking at the quality of the air in that particular location. So this is showing over here where you have this color. This, these are all the hyphae strands. So this is the fungus. And then the green in here, these are the little algae. And then this is the rock or whatever, bark of a tree that they may be on. And then once again, you can see in this picture, the green is the algae. All of this is the fungal hyphae. And like I said, there's different shapes, different colors to them. They can be on rocks, they can be on tree surfaces, etc. So this is just a summary, very basic summary of the characteristics of the different uh, divisions of fungi. Algae. Algae are very simple. Uh, eukaryotic organisms. They are photoautotrophs. So that means they're getting their energy from the sunlight and they are getting their carbon source from non-organic carbon sources such as CO2. They do have sexual reproductive structures within each cell. They're widely distributed throughout the world. They have different morphologies, different um, biochemical traits to them. Most of them are going to be aquatic. They can have different morphologies. Some of them are a single cell. Some of them are very simple multicellular. Some are what we call colonial, so they're in groups. Uh, reproduction in a unicellular algae is oftentimes asexual reproduction followed by uh, mitosis. Uh, they can carry out the sexual reproduction by forming the gametes. Multicellular algae tends to reproduce asexually by fragmentation, and they reproduce sexually with alternation of generations, where you're alternating between a 2N, a diploid, versus a haploid, as seen here. Classification of algae kind of keeps changing as to how they place them. 
usually it's going to be based on differences in the, the pigmentation that's present, uh, differences in storage products and cell wall composition. So there are various groups of them. Most of these are not going to be pathogenic. Some of them will produce toxins and that can be a problem. The green algae or the chlorophytas, um, very similar to plants. They obviously do have chlorophyll. They're going to use sugar and starch as their food reserves. A lot of them have cell walls made out of cellulose. Um, most of these are going to be single cell. Some are filamentous, they live in fresh water. Then you have the red algae or the rhodophyta. Uh, so the name implies they have a red pigment to them. <coughs> Their cell walls are composed of auger um, or carrageenan. This is the one that we will use for uh, obtaining auger that we use in making our petri dishes and making that, that harder gel. It's the same thing. Most of these are marine algae. And this is an example of what it looks like. Obviously, you can see that red pigment. The brown algae, um, most of these, once again, marine algae, and that's what it looks like. Kelp is an example of brown algae. And then the crystal phyta, this is golden or kind of yellow green. This also includes diatoms. That's what a diatom looks like. This table is just showing the different characteristics of the different uh, groups of algae. Environmentally, you're going to look at algae not so much from a medical standpoint. Like I say, they can produce toxins, and that can be an issue um, when, say, there's fish. If there's an algae outbreak in a pond, they're going to deplete the oxygen levels. That can end up having a fish kill. If they're producing toxins, you're not going to want to eat the fish because of the potential of the toxin uh, concentration in the fish. Um, in the summer of 2019, there was a big algae bloom in Lake Pontchartrain in Louisiana that was associated with them opening floodgates from the Mississippi River to prevent flooding in New Orleans. That influx of the fresh water into Lake Pontchartrain, and I mean, it's coming from the Mississippi River, so where do all the farm water waste from the Midwest go? And eventually it ends up in the Mississippi, so it tends to be very high nutrients. And there is a huge, huge algae bloom where the water actually looked green. I do have pictures of those posted. Um, they have to say, do not consume fish or any of the seafood from Lake Pontchartrain while that algae bloom was occurring because there was concern of toxins possibly concentrating in the crab, in the fish, in the shrimp, etc. So that's where you have to be careful in terms of the algae. Water molds. They differ from fungi in several different ways. They, um, the cell wall is composed of cellulose instead of chitin, so they're more similar to plants that way. Spores have two flagella. Um, they tend to decompose in animals, and so they're helping with that nutrient recycling. Some of these are pathogenic um, from an ag agricultural standpoint to plants. Phytophthora infestans is an example of one that is the causative agent of the potato famine that occurred in Ireland in the mid 1800s. Um, absolutely devastating to that country. Um, it was interesting when I lived in the state of Idaho and was doing research, going to school and doing research there. I was in northern Idaho where they do not grow potatoes. Potatoes are grown in southern Idaho because growing potatoes is such a huge part of the economy for the state of Idaho. Even for research purposes, they do not allow this particular organism in the state. Um, a friend of mine and I were considering doing some research with a phytophthora. It was not infestants, it was a different species. And when we found out 
the paperwork, number one, that we had to go through, number two, all the regulations, even though it's not the causative agent of what caused the Irish potato famine, there was so much paperwork involved that we finally said, okay, this was just a, going to be like a little fun side project, so it's not going to be so fun anymore. So we ended up not doing it. But they, they're they very concerned about it because if this were ever to get into the state of Idaho, it could just totally decimate that crop, which would really just ruin the state's economy. This is an example of what water mold can do. And yes, it's recycling organic nutrients right now, but not so good for that goldfish. There are some other eukaryotic organisms that are sometimes of interest to microbiologists, and that would be some of your parasitic helminths, helminths and worms, and vectors. How are the, the vectors work? Um, in transmitting a disease from one host to another. So that's why microbiologists will look at them. So parasitic worms, um, they can have certain stages where they are microscopic and they can be infective and cause different diseases. Arthropod vectors are animals that, as I said, can carry pathogens. Um, two big classes of arthropods and act as vectors are arachnia and insecta. So these are some of the arthropod vectors um, that, like I say, they're, they're, they may not themselves get sick, but they may engulf, say, a bacteria, and then uh, like a mosquito, when it bites you, then it, when it bites you, it's injecting the mosquito to you. Or as a fly, it might be a mechanical vector where it's leaving uh, bacteria or fungal spore from one site to another. Arachnids have four pairs of legs. Ticks are one of the most important vectors that we um, have to deal with from a uh, mechanical uh, medical standpoint. There are some mites that also can transmit diseases that you have to be concerned with. Insects. The difference is that they have three pairs of legs, they have three body regions. This will include fleas, lice, flies, mosquitoes, kissing bugs. And I say mosquitoes are going to be one of the most important vectors for transmission of diseases.